Test, test. Yeah. Just me, sir. <laughs> Work on my posture. Yeah, oh. <laughs> you just arrived today. Last night. Okay. And then as soon as we're done, I'm chasing to the car to get back. I gotta get back to San Francisco tonight. So I'm maybe the next time I'm in San Francisco I'll look you up. Yeah. Let me get my card. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So thank you for joining us today for our conversation of batteries and electrification. Is it sustainable? I was wondering when we came up with that title if the correct grammar, grammar was are they are they sustainable but anyway that's something <laughs> that's just a thing for me uh so i'm jake dean i'm the director of the granger center for supply chain management here um within the uh, wisconsin school of business and i'm carol barford i'm the director of the center for sustainability and the global environment or sage which is part of the nelson institute for environmental studies so a few thank yous. So in addition to the Granger Foundation, the Granger Center, and the Nelson Institute, uh, we want to make sure we thank the Hanson Family Foundation for Sustainability, the Office of Business Engagement, the Office of Sustainability, and the Department of International Business, who all came together to make this event possible. So, so thank you for all, all to them. So we've been doing this event for a number of years now in collaboration um, with the Nelson Institute. Um, and I'm really excited for the discussion um, we're going to have today. So Carol. Uh -huh. All right, well, we are fortunate to have three speakers with us today to talk about batteries and electrification. Uh, first, Maddie Stanislaus in the middle there is the Vice Provost and Executive Director of the Environmental Collaboratory at Drexel University. Eric Dresselhaus is the CEO of ESS. And Emily Pickrell is an NGO journalist with the MacArthur Foundation. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. So let me start things off by asking you each to provide some opening remarks and introduce yourselves and your particular interest in the hot topic of batteries and electrification. They are an energizing topic. <laughs> <laughs> the first part of the test is to make sure that. So my name's Emily and um, this is, I'm actually very excited to be here because it's my first time in Wisconsin. I've been uh, based in Houston for several years. I'm currently in Seattle, but I'm a, a journalist who started looking at energy issues from the vantage point of Houston and thinking, um, starting at the end of the 2010, and have, um, have drifted more and more into issues of electricity, sustainability, batteries, supply chains, um, the int my interest is obviously um, looking at kind of at the big picture, how do all these different parts fit together, but for this panel, I'm bringing the perspective of looking at lithium, and we've, we've all heard a lot about supply chains, we suffered through uh, discussions of supply chains when we were all locked up and, and during the pandemic and trying to understand what that means, why is there a problem, why can't we just go somewhere else and get this stuff. So that's um, the perspective that I, I hope 
to provide for you. A little, little bit of background for myself. Uh, so I am currently the vice provost and director of something called the Environmental Collaboratory, which really intends to bring all the colleges and schools to bring its uh, expertise and resources to design environmental solutions with external partners, but the real centering around social justice and environmental impacts. Uh, prior to that, I, I was working at the World Economic Forum. I was a director of something called the Global Battery Alliance, which brought strength bet bowlers together, everything from Tesla and VW to uh, NGOs, uh, uh, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, with uh, mining companies, you know, to really look at deep, difficult issues of the supply chain. So this is child labor in the supply chain, forced labor in the supply chain. These are environmental impacts uh, from the production of lithium, production of nickel. But how do we actually bring these leaders together to really drive in an independent, verified way uh, in the scale up, or we will have a scale up which leaves uh, impacts behind and communities behind. Uh, prior to that, I served in the Obama administration for eight years. And on this topic, I led the effort with the G7 around something called the Alliance of Resource Efficiency, which really looked at the supply chain as a driver of decarbonization and materials efficiency. Uh, so I'll stop there. Yeah, well, I'm Eric Dresselhaus. Uh, probably relative to this conversation, the two most important data points is I'm the University of Wisconsin class of 87, uh, and uh, uh, which is probably part at least why I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I'm the, I'm the CEO of a company called ESS, which makes grid scale long duration energy storage. So I've worked in the energy energy transition space for uh, about 30 years, a number of companies, including the a couple that were started here in Wisconsin, but I live on the West Coast now, uh, all focused around this idea of, of, uh, of the energy transition. And, um, uh, and, and from the early days when we started to talk about doing uh, solar and wind at scale and thinking about the potential for, um, for alternative renewable sources of energy to be uh, a potential replacement, not just an enhancement uh, to our energy system. Folks that work on the grid kind of said, wait a minute, these are inherently unreliable intermittent resources. And if we went off and did a survey of you as consumers and asked, what's the number one thing you want out of the electricity system, you would probably say, I would like the lights to come on when I flip the switch. And then later, I'd like it to not be too expensive. And third is it'd be great if it didn't destroy the earth along the way. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of finding a way to do that leads you to the need for a massive amount of storage. And the last thing I'd say, just to, from my perspective, when I took over as CEO of this company a couple of years ago, it was... Uh, uh, our company was uh, originally funded and founded by Bill Gates and the Breakthrough Energy Venture Group and SoftBank with the mandate of how can you do this at massive scale? And, and the math behind that, if you haven't thought about it, is we talked about electrifying everything. All the cars are going to be electric. All the buildings are going to be electric. Uh, uh, we're going to electrify industry we were talking about before. We're really not talking about decarbonizing the energy system as we know it today. We're talking about building an entirely new electricity system globally that will have to be somewhere between two and a half and three times the size of the one we have now. And we have to do that in something neighboring 20% of the time it took us to build the one we've got now. And so when you just kind of start to think about how that math goes, and it really ties into our conversation here about, about supply chains and sustainability of the things that are going to help us be sustainable. Uh, I think it, it's important to have a starting point to think about the scale at which we need to do this, uh, because it's not a marginal change. It's really a massively transformational approach at how it's going to happen. All right, thank you. Now that we understand a little bit about uh, the background you bring, I think the, the questions will make a little more sense. Sorry, this is a bit of an awkward thing to, <laughs> to face the audience and safety for the same time. So yeah, and, and not to fall over. So just Eric, a little bit expanding on what you were just talking about. So the, the, the association with the term battery, I think for many of us has gone from energizers to electric cars to now just a, a way to store energy regardless of how it's going to be used. 
why now? Why is the conversation so much more now around batteries? And, and you know, Eric and, and anyone who wants to, to take a stab at that, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, well, you raise an interesting question. Should we call it, is, should we even call it a battery? Because there are lots of ways to store electricity, some of which are batteries the way we traditionally think of them in terms of a chemical solution, uh, but other forms of storage exist that have nothing to do with, with batteries. Uh, but the reason that I think it's become front and center is, um, uh, is, is ultimately kind of a chemistry and a physics problem, right? If we think about all the things we're trying to do from a policy and a lifestyle perspective, um, uh, you know, gasoline for some of its other problems is really a pretty genius thing, right? The energy density of gasoline is great. You don't have to have a very big gas tank and you can go really far away. And so if we're going to try to make the trend, as you, as you could look at any industry you want, you could look at the grid writ large, and you could then say to yourself, well, how am I going to, how would I design a system to replace the way that I do it today? And, and in every domain you look at, whether it's buildings, transportation, industry, mining kind of came up a minute ago. So you can have a fascinating two-hour discussion about about decarbonizing the mining industry and all roads lead to if you can't create a magic time machine that shifts um, the the ability the ability to shift when electricity is consumed from when it is generated you can't solve the problem without solving that problem that's right I, have a, I, I can have a very loud voice. Um, I just wanted to add that- The mic's on your lapel though. I just wanted to add that I, um, in, in looking at lithium and the limitations that it provides on battery supplies, that it's difficult in this sector to limit it to one element. I think that the point that you made about infrastructure, which I've done a lot of looking at, um, the the amount of investment of uh, for our infrastructure to be able to handle the amount of electrification that we're talking about is in the trillions of dollars and not just one. It's a huge, huge limitation. And in my work, uh, talking to folks at KPMG at McKinsey, they they were much more. I wouldn't say more concerned about that, but they see it as as much of a limitation as any discussion of lithium supplies. It doesn't mean that looking at critical minerals and supply chains aren't important. It's just that all of these discussions end up being circular because there's no one answer. Everything connects to everything else, in, in my view. That I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to understand. I think the way you characterize it, the important role of energy storage. So a study that we did with McKinsey, 42% of greenhouse gases effectively can be influenced by batteries. If you look at the transportation sector, the energy sector, but there's some misplaced economic drivers, right? And so we have put a lot of uh, resources, incentives on the production side and not the storage side, right? So we cannot have a green grid in the pace that we're going right now. I mean, the work that you're doing is really great. But you know we need to replicate that across the country because uh, if if you don't displace base load of production and peak load of production on the grid, you will never get to green. So for every megawatt of photovoltaic based energy, you need one megawatt of storage to maximize it. For every megawatt of wind energy, you need three megawatts of energy storage. But we have not aligned the production with the storage side. So it's really crucial to really emphasize, because I think people think of batteries and energy storage as kind of a niche issue. I mean, this is a fundamental issue. Now, I would argue it is the most important and most significant value chain in the history of humanity, but they're all disconnected now. We have sectors who've never, ever cooperated together, and their cultures are pushing against each other. The historic utility culture is a fairly, you know, go slow culture, you know? Uh, I used to represent a utility, I could say that. Okay, so, uh, but we have new players, you know, we have um, the role of uh, 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 electric fleets who can serve as storage, but all the utilities aligning the opportunities of intermittent storage by using uh, electric fleets. 
you know. So, and then we have the mining industry, who've historically been the ignored kind of stepchild of the whole world. But it, the, the mining industry, to your point, has to scale huge, humongous numbers, 24x nickel by 2030, 18x lithium by 2030. Can you imagine that, that scale of growth? Right? And this is currently in places that have forced labor, have child labor, have major environmental issues. And we're not even at this moment even talking about ocean mining. You know, and people are talking about ocean mining and how do we make sure that that is being done? If we do it, we have to make a decision if we do it or not. And if we do it, then how do we make sure we protect the oceans, you know, so. All right, well, that sounds really formidable. And in, in this environment of, uh, of foundational change, how can the regulatory uh, sector hope to keep up with battery technology and battery markets? And I'll sneak another question in there. Uh, similarly, uh, what are the challenges faced by the regional um, independent system operators to try to get the electricity where it needs to go in this, in this kind of, under this regime of change? Well, what, one area that I one area that I've been looking at a lot is the development of ESG, which stands for environmental and social and governance, and that um, it it pertains to this conversation because it is a way that uh, uh, regulators are trying to attack the issue of, of, of how do you regulate something like a supply chain in China and make sure that you don't have slave labor making your, your chips for your, for your technology or, or the lithium, how do you, how do you guarantee that the, that the cobalt isn't coming from, from mining in, uh, in the Congo? And it's a, it's an emerging field that is um, under consideration by the SEC and it, it sounds really wonky and really regulatory. And I, I will confess that I'm a former regulator. I used to work for the GAO. So um, I, kind of, I kind of get into these details, but it, I think in the work that I've done in looking at how can we build strong supply chains for this energy transition globally in a way that's responsible these are tools that we can use. These are tools that we can, can apply to companies and it is not a perfect method, but it does get, it does send a message. I mean, the regulatory, I am also a recovering regulator myself, you know, <laughs> <laughs> having served in the EPA, you know, but I, I think um, I would argue, I mean, let's leave it aside ISO, I mean, independent system operators and come back to it. I think there is a, issue there, but this is a global supply chain. And I don't think a single regulatory regime is going to be able to help and may actually hurt. We're seeing it playing out right now. We have a different re regime in Europe right now um, that tends to be probably more prescriptive than we would accept, you know, and China, the hearings today, if you didn't follow on TikTok, right? So the issue there is heavy regulation and the pulling of data. So you know, I fundamentally believe that, and this is why we, we started and I continue to be on the board of the Global Battery Alliance, that we need to create the framework through a multi-stakeholder process, which includes government, but includes private sector and includes civil society to, to establish the rules of the game. And I would argue that in the era of direct immutable data, that we need to spend much more time on the role of immutable data to provide the verification, whether it's sourcing of materials, whether there's a greenhouse gas footprint. So I, I continue to serve and help kind of shape this idea of product passports. Product passports are intended to be a direct data mechanism of everything from, did a child touch a cobalt and what's the source of that from DRC to how do we make sure that, how do we kind of check the greenhouse gas footprint of production? So to do that, we need to have a data governance rules of the game that we currently do not have. At the last COP, I, I, I held a session, the, the, the conference of parties, the climate conference of parties. Um, we had a session around data governance and we brought together, you know, everything from Tesla and VW to uh, small NGOs in India and Brazil uh, uh, with governments. You know, we don't, we have cybersecurity, we have international 
privacy data issues, uh, data construct. We have cybersecurity. We do not have rules to enable data to drive the kind of outcomes we have. I do believe that whether it's to the auspices of G7 or G20, we need to create a framework around direct immutable data to drive the outcomes rather than having individual nations push a regulatory regime, which I think ultimately is going to lead to fracturing of the supply chain. Well, I'd agree with that. And I, I, please go get that done. <laughs> um, because it also has to be, and there's a, yeah, we just talk about regulation. It, you could probably, you need a whiteboard to lay it out because there, there's, there's regulation at many different levels in this process. And so you talk about something like an independent system operator. I was just on a panel with Elliot Mainzer's team at Cal ISO, the biggest, they've got the biggest problem going. So to the point you were making about, about the generation, um, their rules really encourage the deployment of renewable energy in California. That comes as a surprise to anybody, um, at least see me after class. Uh, but, um, but last year in California, we dumped the polite term we use is curtail. We dumped two and a half terawatt hours of perfectly good juicy renewable energy that somebody paid for into the ground. Why did we do that? Because the, the, the regulatory regime encouraged all sorts of building of renewable energy, but nobody thought about storage and nobody thought about how it is. So the poor Cal ISO folks, their job is just to make it all work, right? So they dumped two and a half terawatt hours of perfectly good electricity to then turn on whatever the gap was in fossil generating electricity to fill the gap to make sure the light stayed on. Okay, something's broken there. So you have these breakdowns in the policy there, but I'll come back, I'll bring a different example that ties into your immutable data example. Uh, people probably are familiar with the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed, a very important, maybe the single most important piece of climate uh, uh, action from the federal government since perhaps the establishment of the EPA itself. Maybe it'll be better, we'll see. Um, what's interesting is there are provisions in that bill because it's, it's of course uh, a climate bill, but it's a jobs bill as well. And so you probably may be familiar that there are a number of provisions in that bill that call for additional incentives for domestic manufacturing. So if you, if you buy a battery, um, it, you can get a 30% investment tax credit for a period of time. But if you buy an American battery, it's 40% investment tax credit, right? Sounds like a good idea. Sounds like the right, you know, aligning incentives. But here's the simple question. What does it mean to build a battery in America? Nobody actually knows the answer to that question. And the fight that's going on to define the rules of what an American-made battery means is a giant fight between unlikely bedfellows and foes, because you have a lot of folks who couldn't care less about climate, really care a lot about domestic jobs and kind of really hate China, just to put it out there. And then you've got a lot of folks who care a lot about the environment, and they're actually not so concerned about jobs. And in some cases, they're willing to look past where the stuff got built and how it got built, if it's helping to push forward the agenda of decarbonizing the electricity system. I'll close one eye and look the other way if it helps me get to the point. We don't have a good mechanism right now to resolve that problem. My, my full disclosure is our company builds all of our batteries in the US with about 86% sourced American materials. So we have an incredibly biased point of view on this. But what, what I think it does show is that it can be done. And I, well, I just I was just going to say my I put my trade hat on for a second that these issues are not new to battery production and any kind of supply chain. I mean, I looked at agonizing issues of textiles and they have definitions of different kinds of threads and how much percentage can be sourced in order for it to be uh, specified as uh, for, for the NAFTA agreement. And one of the things that 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 I've been wondering about in, in all of this is how did, do you guys have any views on, does it make any difference that we're not part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership at this point? It's it's interesting that um, it comes at it. I mean, Chile is a member of the TPP and um, I don't know if it would make any difference for battery production mm -hmm. or not. 
Well, I mean, the U.S. has established essentially with some of the same parties and partnerships with about 20 countries right now on the, on the battery value chain, mostly focused on the environmental and social impact. So everything from establishing common standards among those 20 nations to uh, providing some, uh, some seed funds mm -hmm. for um, d implementing those, those standards in those countries. So th th that is uh, going on. So, but it needs to be scaled up. <laughs> Isn't I, just just to, for those who are not complete trade nerds, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was initially envisioned as a trade deal that would, in some ways, uh, be a bulwark against um, China dominating uh, the economy um, in different aspects, and it was uh, designed for between Pacific countries and and. Um, Several Asian countries, but South America, uh, lithium producers such as Chile were also involved. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll just add. You know, the, the role of um, investors, you know, BlackRock institutional investors, and uh, I can't tell you who, but you know, I, I was reflecting a conversation with, with a colleague uh, uh, from uh, the the largest EV company in the world. I'm not going to name whom that is. You know, <laughs> so you know, so the, the institutional investors are pushing. Direct verification, right? And so I, I think it's an important role that, that institutional investors are playing. And, and maybe I'll just do a one political commentary. You know, mm -hmm. so um, the, the the pushback on ESG not only is it ridiculous, you're going to lose market share. That's why I would just say, you want to push back against ESG, feel free. You will lose market share. You will not be able to sell a product in Europe or Asia or Latin America. So this ridiculous pushback against ESG, you know, and the financial sector who's pushing ESG, you know, I think it's just short-sighted and it's uninformed, you know, so I'll stop the commentary now. <laughs> All right, so we've been talking about lithium as a key, you know, key material to batteries. Can we discuss just for a second, so what are some of the big issues that exist in lithium mining and lithium production that are particularly harmful? And are there ways that we could reduce those um, either by potentially making more of it here in the US or potentially looking at substitute materials so we wouldn't have to mine lithium to the extent that we that we currently do? Um, well, I have spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at the development of our, of our uh, lithium supply chain or domestic. And that you had asked earlier, how much we're producing right now? And the answer is not much. And the reasons for it, um, in my view, have a lot to do with the general, our general approach to a lot of industrial products projects. I see the same trends in asking, why haven't we built any refineries in the last 40 years? Why are the gas prices going up? Why is, there's this, why is there this mysterious shortage? And it has a lot to do with our attitude towards um, uh, these big complicated industrial projects and um, that we don't want them in our backyards. Um, and so that is, there's a history of lithium. Uh, the demand is obviously much higher right now than it was the last time we saw a big spike for lithium. It was related to uh, building nuclear weapons. Um, and as um, the race against Russia or the Soviet Union fell, so did the interest in, in having a domestic lithium supply chain. The price went down and it was cheaper and easier to buy it in countries where labor costs were low and environmental regulations were lax. So as we step forward now, we want a lithium supply, we want a domestic lithium supply. Every In a perfect world, everyone agrees, pretty most people agree that it'd be real nice if the US, how many, raise your hands if you think it'd be real nice to have a US uh, domestic lithium supply. Yeah, it doesn't, that sounds like a pretty good deal. There is lithium in this country. It is not that there is a shortage. The problem is, is that these projects, they're expensive, they have, environmental consequences, and you can mitigate against the environmental consequences, but you need regulations. And it, the other thing that's really important to understand, whether we do it here or we do it overseas, is that 
this is not a fast process. It's slower in the United States. And I called these companies. I spent January calling these companies. And one of the big hurdles for them is getting certain levels of environmental permits. And my editor's like, okay, so they get finance, then they get the permits or they get permits. And then no, no, it's like, there's a step of going. And I'm sure you guys know more about these kinds of things that you get, you can get more financing on the basis of, of having passed certain environmental hurdles. Um, so that, that's really, it's a, it's not, there's not one thing that prevents this country from having a domestic supply of lithium, but it, it's all these pieces working together, the companies having enough confidence that they won't be blocked for environmental reasons and that the communities having enough confidence that the companies are willing to make the kinds of safeguards so that they're not unjustly paying a high uh, environmental cost for having this project. I honestly was very encouraged talking to these different companies because they were so, focused on making sure that they had environmental safeguards and were really addressing the, 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 the interests of the local communities in developing them that I, I feel like the projects will move forward. That said, we are, none of these new projects are producing lithium at this point. The most optimistic of them, there's a company, and I've forgotten his name, but in North Carolina that just this couple months ago, um, got um, a, a key permitting uh, advancement and they they are talking about 2026 for production so that that they can, and this is fast this is fast tracked uh mining that hasn't been done in 30 40, 40 years there's not there haven't been a lot of new mines folks in this country so these are big steps ahead it's just going to take some time and it will take time whether it's in mexico or argentina or peru it'll take time yeah, I, I, I would say it's a, it's a complicated problem in the U.S. Uh, and um, I mean, let's face it, the mining industry in the U.S. has a horrible reputation. The number one cause of Superfund sites is mining, right? So there's a history of bad practices. It's not to say, and there are some companies who want to lead in this space, but if you want to, we need to deal with that history. You know, so... Can we develop, and I think there are some companies trying to do kind of forward-leaning kind of mining practices, you know, and, but, you know, there's a real difficult issue. So I, 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 I'm the, during my office at EPA, we pushed out financial assurance so that mining companies have the adequate financial assurance so that if things go wrong, they pay for it and the taxpayer doesn't pay for it. Right now, the taxpayer pays for 95% of everything that goes wrong with mining operations. The, the, the whole economic model of mining operations is what I call the New York taxi cab example. There are in, every mine is self-incorporated with a single corporation to hide their assets, right? So unless there's a different economic model, I don't see substantial mining happening in the US. But, but even that being said, I, you know, the need for lithium is going to get overtaken in time by solid state batteries. I do not think that investing substantial lithium makes sense from an economic competitiveness perspective. I think we're, we're going to, we, the, all the investment we're probably going to lose because it's going to be overtaken by other minerals. What I think we do need to do is to break the log jam that currently exists of nickel, lithium, cobalt, manganese, which are processed in one country, right? 80% is processed through one country. That is what- That country's China, by the yeah, way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the logjam that we need to do to make us competitive. I, I would, I think the, the innovation that you're doing is where we need to incentivize. Kind of the more, the middle and the back end of the supply chain, not the mining side from my perspective. You know, so. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. The most optimistic scenario I've, ever, I've seen from anybody who was from a lithium miner, so you know it was inflated, was that we could double our lithium production in the United States, taking us to 2% of global lithium production <laughs> at a cost that's three times the market rate for lithium today. And that's assuming we do it in a clean, sustainable way. So 
if anybody wants to, we'll, we'll start a little pool out back. I don't, gambling's not legal in Wisconsin, so we probably have to keep it on the down low. Uh, but if anybody wants to take a pool and they want to place their chips on the we're going to outmine China strategy, uh, let me know, because I'll take the bet every time. Uh, it's a loser game. So my vote would be don't play a game you know you're going to lose. Uh, and uh, and I do think we have to, uh, anything we can do to create transparency around the true full economic cost, and that can be economic, you know, dollars and cents costs, it can be full carbon cost. Anything we can do to level the playing field um, to make transparent choices across uh, the decisions we're making, I'm a big fan of, because uh, I have an, an economics degree from the University of Wisconsin, so I'm pretty mm -hmm. smart about that stuff. Right. But what we have, what happens now is we have all sorts of hidden costs and subsidies. If you haven't followed the reason that China has, you say 80, I think you're being nice. Uh, lithium last time I checked was like 92 or 92.5% with Korea ducking in a little bit on the margins. Right. Um, uh, how does that happen? You might ask yourself. Uh, it's because the Chinese government uses G to G government incentives to buy mining rights in places like Africa and uh and latin america and then they turn it over all to extract the materials from that country process the materials and make the batteries to create jobs in china the the, the cards are stacked against you from day one uh when uh when you go that route and there are a lot of people that are trying to do more to domesticate you've seen announcements for domestic battery uh production which is a good step in the right direction where does the raw material come from it's still coming from china because China's jumped the, they, they the very smart strategic move. They bought all the mineral rights in all of these countries where it's really easier to extract and the environmental regulations a little less. Uh, Isn't enforced. it that processing is really messy and, as well? I mean, that it. No, the, well, the pro, it depends on where you are in the processing chain. So the initial processing has to be done on site. So you get raw lithium comes out of generally waterbeds. Mm -hmm. And then you bake it down and you do an initial processing in country. That's incredibly messy. It's incredibly polluting. Uh, it can be cleaned up. It can be controlled, but it costs money. And, you know, who wants to spend that money? And then that raw lithium is moved to China where it's processed into actual battery cells. So if you look at a little battery, a little, little C cell battery lithium cell, that part's all done in country in China. And that's not as messy, but it's where the, it's where the value add and the proposition comes from. And so that's where the jobs are. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting but controversial opportunity. So uh, there's a bit of nationalism that's going on in Chile, Argentina, a lot of the African countries. So I think they're making a, a valid point that we want to not only produce the rock, we want to get some economic opportunities in processing that. So I think that if we are able to partner with these countries, and this sounds weird, as part of their nationalistic strategy, <laughs> Right. I, I don't think there's a long term gain in terms of the, the far upstream side of the mineral processing. Right. I do think there's some interesting strategic opportunities. If we help Chile and Argentina, um, uh, there's some work going in Kenya uh, and South Africa mm -hmm. to enable it to develop in country processing. So they can own some of the economic productivity, and then we can then have more direct uh, sending those processed material minerals to the U.S. I mean, this is challenging, but I think I think that's the way we break the law, Jen. Yeah, so I agree. Well, there's a concept now. You know, uh, there used to be onshoring and offshoring, and now we have a thing called friendshoring. Right. So there are companies like Northvolt, uh, Fryer, and others, uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, they happen to have a lot of really cheap electricity, hydropower in that part of the world. So this is very energy, and it's actually in energy intensive to make batteries, which is a really funny thing under, to me. I don't know, that's just weird, uh, but it's it's true. Um, so they're they're building um, uh, uh, battery processing manufacturing facilities in places like Norway. It's pretty interesting because they can get relatively cheap, really clean electricity. And they're actually advertising, we're going to be the cleanest battery manufacturing around and you might say well how does that work it's because the electricity that made the battery was clean and that's one of the biggest carbon contributors to the manufacturing of a lithium battery so th th these things are possible i agree let's go find the people there's a lot of lithium and we have a little bit of lithium here for sure you know where they have more lithium australia mm. 
last time I checked, we're still relatively friendly with them. So um, uh, they're the leader. Yeah. yeah. So they've got a lot of potential in a lot of uh, a lot of mining, and and you kind of get at least some level of confidence that it's going to be administered and and monitored and managed in a in a more sustainable, cleaner way. So there are paths through this, but it all starts with the point you made earlier around: is there data and transparency? Uh, if there's no if there's no truth in labeling on the food package, you know how do you know uh, where 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 you know where the chicken came from? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's, it's hard. So let me. I, I know we didn't touch on kind of the circular economy aspect of this, right? But um, I mean, the, the the conversation of the demand is exclusively focusing on the the mining side, but not about how do we design for recovery of minerals. How do we extend the life of batteries? So there have been a, a, a numerous uh, pilots around the globe around repurposing EV batteries for fixed storage. Right? So I think we could scale it up. There are a couple. There are a couple of technical issues that we need to resolve, but really easily solve technical issues about a second life. They, in general, you, you probably know this better than based on the studies I've seen. About seventy-three percent of energy storage capacity remains. Why don't you take a battery off of a mobility device? 73%. 73% of the investment remains. So <laughs> I do think that repurposing, but we're going to be potentially doing a study with the, with the World Economic Forum on this. How do we really kind of scale up second use batteries? Mm -hmm. But then how do we actually make things easier to recover min uh, minerals and minerals? This is kind of this tough conversation. I'd be interested in your point is that. So I keep running into the, this thing about design. It's like a, it's a secret sauce, right? How you assemble a battery pack, there's no secrecy to it, but there's still a fight about common assembly and disassembly. So based on this international consultation that, I, that I've done is that uh, if, 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 if folks can know the specific constituency of a battery and be able to disassemble, We've reduced the recycling cost by 25%, right? And from a repurposing perspective, 75%. So this is just how knowledge or the lack of knowledge really impedes maximizing the return of investment. Yeah, well, the short answer, and we'll get to the question is, we can't get the world to agree on a common EV plug. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right? What would seem like the most obvious mm -hmm. thing? We've got everybody to figure out that the same gas, you know, uh, fuse should be the same size so that you could get any gas station you wanted against any car. We got to get electric vehicle manufacturers to all settle on a mm -hmm. on a standard for plugging in. All right. So I love learning all these hard facts <laughs> about lithium batteries. It's awesome, but I'm going to ask to pivot away from lithium and think about other alternatives for energy storage. Uh, some that are interesting, green hydrogen, compressed air, even rocks underground for seasonal length storage. In what situations are these technologies viable alternatives to metal-based batteries, and are there new developments on the horizon? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll take that one to kick it off. There are more different ways to store electricity than you ever thought of. Mm -hmm. That's the technical answer to the question. Um, and then the, the, those you mentioned and beyond. So you've got um, some forms of energy storage and sometimes people will ask me, well, how long has energy storage been around? And I used to carry a picture of the Hoover Dam around with me mm -hmm. and say, well, the Hoover Dam's a battery, right? I assume that people know that. The Hoover Dam holds potential energy up at the top and when we need it, we flow it through a turbine and we turn the turbine and it makes electricity, it's a battery, right? It's a gravity-based battery system. And those have been around for a really long time. In fact, other people are trying to come up with next-generation gravity-based systems. Um, and they can work well in some applications. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, the point I should have made to start with is that um, there's been a tendency, especially among technologists, to try to come up with a silver bullet solution that says, here's the one thing that's going to solve all the problems. And at least my experience with something as big as what we've talked about here, the scope of what we have to do is you need silver buckshot, right? There's, if you're waiting for the one thing that's going to solve all the problems, it, it, you're probably going to be waiting for a long time. 
you need a variety of diff a variety of different solutions that are specifically fit for purpose for the thing you're trying to do. So we make a battery that's known as an iron flow redux battery. And we think it's an awesome battery for all sorts of reasons, right? It stores a lot of electricity uh, for very long durations of time. It's uh, it's largely sourced. It's we've got by the DOE's estimate, we are the lowest carbon input manufactured battery around today. And we're 98% recyclable at the end of life. It's a miracle. You'd say, I want, I want iron flow batteries everywhere. The problem is they're big. You do not want an iron flow battery cell phone. I'll guarantee you that, right? You're never going to build cars with iron flow batteries. But you can make all of the grid things you need to do happen with that kind of technology, right? You've got, you mentioned some of the, some of the heat-based batteries. Heat-based batteries, there's a whole category of them that are cr literally creating molten lava in contained environments. And they're really awesome, they're really great at, at, and effective at storing excess, taking excess renewables and heating rocks or molten salts. And there's a bunch of different kinds that you can do it, which are awesome. The, the, the problem, if you wanna call it a problem is it's not very efficient to take that heat and try to create electricity again with it. It's too lossy to go electricity to heat to electricity. But if you need heat, which by the way, everybody in Wisconsin knows you need heat. Um, I, and I'm, I'm kind of joking about your house. Industrial, you're trying to decarbonize steel production. You're trying to decarbonize iron production. Heat batteries are awesome uh, potential for that. So there are a variety. And then you mentioned the one that's probably the most top of mind for people in the consumer space are solid state batteries. So you can go with solid state batteries. There are a number of companies out there um, uh, working on them. None of them are at commercial scale yet. But it's really uh, awesome that people are putting the effort. And there's, I'm sure, um, uh, from the laundry list of stuff I saw happening in the engineering school today, people are working on lots of cool things that could be components of solid state batteries in the future. Um, my, my kind of American entrepreneurial worldview is to you know, optimize what you have in the short term and then find a better mousetrap in the long term. And, and, and I think that's where you're going to see storage go. We're probably going to leapfrog uh, uh, that somewhere in the, in the 15 to 20 year out mark, lithium will be a relatively small portion of the total battery population and alternative technologies that are, um, you know, lithium may be kind of the Swiss army knife that's good for a lot of things, but it's not the optimal for any of them. Uh, and with some of the baggage that comes with how they come, there is a possibility that we could see certainly the dominance decline, if not the appropriateness uh, fade away. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, you mentioned the Hoover Dam. There's some um, uh, serious work being done about a uh, pumped hydro yeah. you know, in a very regionalized way. You know, we don't need a Hoover Dam to really, there's existing capacity that exists throughout this country and it's very regional, right? So I think there's an opportunity to look at pumped hydro as a storage device. You know, there's also, um, um, DOE just pushed out these uh, regional hydrogen hubs. So we're going to have to, so I think hydro, we, we have to have an all of the above strategy, right? Hydrogen plays a role. Um, storage plays a role. Um, pumped hydro plays a role. And there, there can be other things that we, we have to look at. You know, the one kind of impediment is that we have this archaic long distribution system in the U.S., that to really maximize efficiency, we need to have distributed energy systems, right? I mean, so we're going to make ourselves more resilient. So, I mean, the the innovation you're making really, really fits in an urban environment. But we have an infrastructure that is at large transmission lines for distribution. So I think we need to begin intentionally reversing that that model. There's also, I think, there's a huge opportunity in the global south. Global south is really pushing. Uh, and I, I work with the World Bank and a whole microgrid strategy, right? So to, 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 to leapfrog away from the need to do these long transmission lines. So if you have significant storage, you can then deliver electricity at a very localized way. And I think uh, whether it's kind of rural centers, the idea of microgrids should take, should, uh, there should be more emphasis on microgrids and, and local production and distribution. I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to add on to that. I most recently worked on a story looking at um, EVs versus hydrogen fueled vehicles. The one part of the reason for the big 
uptick in, in lithium and the interest in batteries is obviously because we're looking at um, how to decarbonize our transportation fleet. And um, that is an area, the, the technology behind, I mean, someone may wanna kill me afterwards, but the technology behind hydrogen vehicles is sound. They're not bad vehicles. Um, the challenge, as we've talked about in other areas, it gets back to the I word, infrastructure, and the huge amount of investment, it costs about two, $2 million per hydrogen fueling station. And that those are the kinds that it, it, it gets back to the same themes, no matter how you approach this. As a country, how much political will do we have to have all of this huge investment for electricity and a huge investment for fuel? The um, One of the fellows that I was particularly impressed with from, the McKinsey, from McKinsey said that in his view, when we get to about 65% of our fleet being electrified, that's the point where the grids are gonna really start to suffer and, and, and have some real challenges. And that's when he views that there'll be a, more of a, a spike in interest in hydrogen. And I just wanted to fit it in, in yeah. the discussion of battery storage, because as you pointed out, hydrogen is a way to store electricity that is not a battery. It is actually another option. It can be an option for a vehicle. It could be option as a, as a, as a, I don't know how that would work, but as a fuel storage, they are. Um, I was uh, speaking to a hydrogen expert at Washington State University, and they're doing a lot of work on looking at how to use hydrogen for storage. So it's, it's a, is it a good option? Yeah, I, just, I mean, we must have hydrogen, right? In terms of, long range trucks, um, airplanes, we, we have to have hydrogen in the mix. The batteries are simply, you know, announced, you know, simply too heavy to have an electrified airplane. I know there's some examples of that, which I question whether we're ever gonna have an electric airplane, you know, significant commercial. I think hydrogen fuel is really gonna be green hydrogen fuel. Okay. It's gonna be necessary for kind of the large vehicles. So that's, that needs to be in the mix. Well, and, and but to, to your point, there's, you know, there's, if you haven't gone down the hydrogen rainbow, uh, you know, there's <laughs> blue and pink and fruits <laughs> and mauve and, you know, all the different combinations. Uh, but that's a great case. Uh, hydrogen is very much at the peak of the hype cycle right now, and people are starting to pay a little bit more attention to the details. Hydrogen has great applicability. First off, we use a lot of hydrogen today in industrial applications. So just greening that would go a long way uh, and be great. Lots of good transportation choices, including long trucking. Hydrogen is actually really hard to transport. Uh, if you haven't looked at your periodic table recently, hydrogen molecules are really tiny. They're incredibly hard to store for long periods of time. Uh, they're really slippery. Um, uh, and uh, it's really expensive and somewhat dangerous to hold them in large quantities. So it, the people say hydrogen is going to solve all the problems. Again, any, uh, my only, if you take nothing else away from this, anybody across the world of sustainability or infrastructure that tells you there's a thing that's going to solve all the problems, you can immediately know that that person has not really done any homework with it. And if you, if you don't know who Michael Liebrick is, um, uh, you know, and you want to study up on, on hydrogen, he will... It's, it's almost funny how much he hates hydrogen. Um, like I said, I knew yeah. somebody would want to kill me. I didn't, no, I didn't want to kill you. I don't want to kill you with it because I actually have a, a good friend, uh, two, two of the, the, the chairman of the, of the uh, Global Hydrogen Alliance is on my board of directors. Uh, we actually think, as a side note, totally biased advertising, you actually can't make hy green hydrogen without giant batteries. Right? So something that people never account for because it sounds easy is, uh, a hydrogen electrolyzer, and there's a couple of different ways you can make hydrogen, and this isn't really a hydrogen talk, but, you, but the way that hydrogen electrolyzation happens is you need a constant flow of electricity into it. So people say, I'll just use solar power to do it, except for we've just established that solar and wind power are inherently intermittent, so you can't do that. You cannot have a, uh, an electrolyzer that flips on and off and on and off the machine will last five minutes. Making hydrogen, the reason that so many people like it is it looks a lot and has a very similar business model to petrochemical processing and sales. People, big oil companies, Exxons of the world hate things like solar because it's not compatible with, not with their technology model, with their business model. Once you do it, you're self-sustaining and you don't have to buy it anymore. 
if you buy hydrogen, you have to keep buying hydrogen forever, just like you have to keep buying gasoline forever. And so it's the it's nothing to do with technology and everything to do with what someone's worldview of business model looks like. Fascinating. I've learned so much. Um, so one of the things, Eric, you mentioned is this these two dimensions of, of problems, both um, technological and, and political. What are the big ones in each of those categories and, and what needs to happen to, to mitigate them? Any easier questions? <laughs> so, uh, well, on the technology side, um, and we <laughs> hit on some of this, the, uh, I've spent a long time working in different parts of energy transition. And the one thing that's really hard about uh, everything in this space, and it's been alluded to a couple of times through some of the comments that people have made is, you're, you're almost always replacing an existing thing, right? So if you're trying to do something new in the world of energy, you're probably up against something that's been optimized for the last 50 to 100 years. Every penny of cost has been squeezed out. It's got a fully optimized supply chain and manufacturing and distribution model. The, the thing I was told the very first time I started in this space is if somebody comes to you and says, you've never seen a cell phone before, you've never heard of that, and somebody comes and shows you a cell phone, and says, would you like one of these? You know, People can call you anywhere. You can call anybody from anywhere. They're totally no longer time and distance. People in this room, or some of you at least, are old enough to remember when you used to have to make appointments to be at the phone at a time to make a call and that kind of stuff. You know, and, and you look at it and say, wow, that would totally change my life. Right? Somebody comes to you with an LED light bulb and you've only got an incandescent light bulb. You kind of look at it and go, ah, I already got a light. Is it a better light bulb? Sure. You know, is it more sustainable? Is it better for the earth? But it isn't revolutionary. And most of the things we're trying to do in energy, in terms of the output that people get from it, is same, same. So the technology challenge where I'm coming back to is that you are competing against the, the hurdle rate, the bar as a technology innovation is really high because you're competing against something that already exists, probably, that has been cost optimized. Uh, and you're way up here on the cost curve and you've got to leap from there to there. And that makes it really, really hard to do. And then that ties back to the policy side. To me, the policy side is it's really hard to make policy at a state level, at a federal level, at a national level, wherever you go around the world. And so um, uh, if, if we have policies and a, and a regulatory structure that has been developed again over a long period of time. And so... Having created a in the crackler, um, uh, we've we've got to we've got to get everybody to keep coming back to be, to be at the end of the line. What is the what is the um, what what are kind of the core guiding principles and try to not regulate details along the way, just set the goals. Right, the thing I come back to you worked at the EPA is. It, uh, the, I don't know. And I'm not sure. That it's Here's the test. It's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Five bucks, just like I told you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that's right. I, I, can, I can do it without. With the two most successful pieces of environmental legislation in the history of America, my view, is the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And what those bills didn't try to do is dictate the technology choice. It only dictated the outcome of what the answer had to be, but it didn't tell anybody how to do it. So if we're thinking about the decarbonization of the electricity system, we should just set the goals on the outcomes and then let everybody innovative, exciting, whatever, say, as long as we have 100% decarbonized electricity system, you can put in anything you want. I don't care what it is. It just has to actually be zero carbon. And then you can put in a metric for the supply chain to build that thing. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I don't know, you probably put in a few things if you were talking about the utilities around reliability, resiliency, uptime, and just let people loose to go figure out the most cost-effective way to meet those outcomes. I'm actually pretty optimistic that we get there in a big, bad hurry. Yeah, I mean, on the politics side, I, mean, I, I think that, you know, I think what Eric is doing, I mean, if long storage batteries were viewed as 
very, very skeptically, even two years ago, three years ago, four, you know, I mean, and the law, I mean, it's, it's such a crucial technology and it's just innovation and markable. That's what it should happen, right? But I, I think there's a little bit of catching up. So law, you mentioned in this independent system operators, which tends to be fiefdoms on their own, right? And tends to, you know, really have regional bias, right? And so I, I would say that revamping the rules to what Eric's point, which I completely agree with, be technology agnostic, but really push, uh, you know, the, the, the distribution side, right? And so that's, that's something that I, I think is really important, you know, and there's a whole packing order of distribution that I, uh, ISOs play a role in, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a nudge to, in terms of the role of storage, the role of green energy, green hydrogen, whatever they may be. There's also rate recovery, which doesn't get that much discussion. Uh, so um, Germany, just by uh, allowing rate recovery for a, a grid-based storage has completely accelerated a, a storage connected to the grid. We don't really have a conversation about rate recovery. You know, and rate recovery is this like hyper, going back to the bad old heavy regulated days, it's still done on a state by state basis, right? So we do need to look at how we reform the rate recovery to really drive innovation, but not be prescriptive of the kind of innovation we're talking about. Patty, for the benefit of the students in my class, could you please tell them what rate recovery is? Oh, rate recovery. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's a full embedded cost of producing energy. You know, it includes the energy production side, the transmission side, the distribution side, it gets all put into this pot and then goes in front of the Public Service Commission to determine how much of that can be recovered in rates because it's it's fair that it's all produced. And some of this like is your stop of business practices. You know? so. it, it ensures that the projects are fine. It's a way of it's yeah. a way of financing. It, it ensures that it rather than you know having to, it's like each kid that drives your car has to pay 20 bucks per mile or whatever. That would be. That's how I always think of it. Well, I, I, I agree with that, but I would throw out for people's consideration as we're talking about ESG along with decarbonization, that the regulated utility system that was developed down the road in Chicago was the first, you know, comment was the first regulated utility. Samuel Unsold thought this up because we used to have <laughs> companies running wires down the street and everybody agreed that was kind of dumb. Um, but part of that comes down to we made a societal choice that we thought access to electricity was a public health and safety economic driver. If you think about all of the discussions that have come up in the last few years around uh, universal access to the internet and what that does to create economic and you know, uh, uh, lack of, uh, of fairness in society, long before we thought about the internet, access to electricity, starting with things like the Rural Electrification Act happened. Right? That was really important societal choices we made. As we go to decarbonization and we talk about rejiggering the system, which needs some rejiggering, we have to remember that universal access to electricity at a fair price is really, really important. And I don't think anybody is consciously choosing to throw that out. But if you don't, then the problem is this in a nutshell. I live in the Bay Area right now. There's a town called Atherton. You've heard of it. Healthiest amongst the two wealthiest zip codes in America. Everybody's got four solar panels, three Teslas, and a big battery, right? And they buy $3.22 a month worth of electricity. Nothing. Generate all their own, and they're self-sufficient. So they pay nothing to connect to the grid, except for when there's three unsunny days, and then they've got full access. Two miles away in East Palo Alto, one of the poorest areas in country, nobody can afford solar panels and don't have credit ratings that are high enough to go off grid. So they are paying now 24 and a half cents a kilowatt hour average wow. cost of electricity. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's probably not sustainable because as we get more and more what so-called grid defectors, people who can afford through their own personal wealth to get off grid, what's going to happen is the total cost of maintaining the grid, the system, gets reallocated through the rate making process to the people that buy electricity. The people who buy electricity are the people who can't afford to buy electricity in a weird way, right? And so you're gonna have this cross. It, the math worked when we were all in the same, it's kind of like an insurance, right? 
We all were paying mm -hmm. in and the costs were even evenly spared across, uh, across all of the participants. And you could use the regulatory thing to have things like um, uh, uh, incentive programs or, or subsidy programs for low-income households and things like that. Nobody is buying electricity from the grid in the future. That system collapses. What is the split between residential and industrial, though? Because that doesn't, uh, uh, in usership of, or do you see a future where the, the industrial companies are off the grid as well? It's happening today, all the time. And they're doing it not just through, their, uh, you pay in typically in the rate making process, you're paying some amount for, and you can go home and look at your electric bill. Probably nobody did it. If I made you look at your electric bill tonight, I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, some part of your bill uh, comes from the actual cost of the electricity. Some part is from the distribution fee, right? That balance between the two things is a really, really important thing. What we used to say was, because we wanted universal access, the access charge, the grid charge was really small, right? Because we want everybody to be able to afford to be on the grid. And then if you don't have a lot of money, just try not to use a lot of electricity. It all works out, but at least you're connected. And so what we kept doing was we kept changing the dollars more onto the electricity side. And what that did is it made it more cost effective for you to do, if you could, to deflect, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get off the grid and put in a solar panel or something else. So that math is really upside down right now. If you haven't followed it, there's a big problem in California now, what they're calling NEM3, net energy metering. What that is in the old net energy metering world, uh, you can put solar panels on your roof and the utility, regardless of when you pushed it back onto the grid, the utility would pay you the full retail price of electricity. Even if by pushing it back on, it was at two o'clock on a Tuesday and they didn't need the electricity and dumped it in the ground. You still got paid 15 cents a kilowatt hour for it, even though the wholesale price of that electricity was probably four cents. You know who paid for it? Or people without solar panels. Well, on that uplifting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for audience questions. So um, I, I see your hand, sir. I'll get that. So I do want to steal a, um, a, a statement that Dean Paul Robbins of the Nelson Institute said the first time we did this. When you're considering your questions, please make sure they end with a question mark. <laughs> All right. So, sir, I'll come back to you um, and then we'll go from there. So I, I didn't hear any mention that hydrogen is a global warming gas. That's important for people to understand. I, I see a place for local hydrogen production and use with, with tight controls on leakage. Uh, hydrogen, like methane, leaks a lot. Estimates are one to 2% will leak. And what it does is potentiates existing methane in the atmosphere. It lengthens the life of methane. Uh, the other thing I'd like to ask about, what would facilitate uh, these new technologies coming along as fast as possible and would bring them into, uh, you know, uh, uh, at least prototype applications? So there might be public funding to require and, and, and requirements to put them into the grid and, uh, and scale up. I think if I followed your company correctly, uh, you're involved in some of these prototype efforts right now, but the grid is very skeptical about the lifetime of other technologies, uh, rightfully so. It should last 20 or 30 years, but what do we need right now to accelerate the alternatives? I, I see, I agree, lithium is, is transitional. Uh, uh, my two cents. First off, thank you for your comments on the carbon uh, impact of, uh, of methane and hydrogen. Absolutely true statement of fact. Um, I, I actually will argue that that there's uh, we're in such a better place today. I started my first company in the clean energy space in 1996. So I laugh a lot when people talk about clean tech 1.0 in like 06 and you know 2006 and seven, I'm like, I must've been there for 0.1 the beta. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's actually, I think a fair amount of money available at a venture level, a grant level, at a university level for the early stage stuff. Um, and getting it to kind of prototype working 
concept level, but you hit on something that's really important. The rule of thumb in the energy industry is that people want cutting edge technology 10 years proven in the field. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Uh, so where we the gap, in my view, is the gap is to scalability, right? So you've got it, you know, it works, it's a lab thing, it's it's effective. But how do I give it that push to get it from that to a meaningful, not its ultimate level of scale, but how do you get, you know, it, zero to one isn't the hardest thing. One to 10 is the hardest phase of, of scaling this technology. For, for solid state lithium batteries, that's the challenge that they're up against now, is my understanding, is that that uh, scalability is one of the biggest challenges? I, I think it's that, and I think it's cost, right? So if you look at companies like QuantumScape and SAS and some other companies that are working in the space, really cool concept, possible lithium replacement. And everybody says, great, it's better than lithium. As long as it just costs the same as lithium, I'm in, right? Except their problem is it's day, metaphorically, day one for, for those companies. And lithium's 15 years down the cost out journey, or as we like to say in the renewable energy business, the learning curve. Right? We don't like to call it cheapening or you know, cost out. We just call it the learning curve through manufacturing scale and volume. So that's always one of the challenges that I was trying to refer to, be, to before is if you're, start, if you're at the top part of that curve and the thing you're trying to replace is way down here on the curve, people are going to say, I think your thing is cool, but how do I manage that gap? There's an economic gap. Some people have tried to call it the green premium. I don't know what we call that when we're replacing one green thing with another green thing or the next generation. But there's a premium that gets paid in the early stages. And if you don't figure out a way to get through that, you can kind of get stuck up at that earlier phase. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I'll give a really bad example. But uh, during the time when uh, the electricity sector was trying to deregulate and try to uh, induce smaller producers, they carved out for independent power producer agreements to kind of kind of create that incentive. And I just, maybe there's a bad idea, I'll just throw it out anyway. But but if there's a group of technologies that have been proven at a bench slightly scale, maybe you wanna do some national competition and say, let's do some preferential rates to really assist that nudge to scale up, you know? So don't quote me on that. Here. <laughs> Other questions, all right. Does the panel think that government policies are giving, you know, like crazy deadlines? Because like European Union, California, and New York are stating like within the next 10 to 12 years, uh, there's going to be a ban on all gasoline and diesel cars and trucks. And to me, I think that's unrealistic. Well, why don't you go? Oh, um, <clears throat> if... <laughs> from. I, my short answer would be, I don't know. And um, in terms of whether they're viable or not, but looking at cars, for example, and some of the, some of the um, targets that have been set, they are for new sales. I think that's one thing that I found tends to get lost in the discussion. And I, I very much agree that we need to think in terms of all of the above um, in our energy solutions, because for as much as there's been an emphasis on, on EVs, there are going to be carbon combustion vehicles on the road in, in the next 30 or 40 years. There's going to be a lot of them. And if we tell the auto manufacturers that they should not be investing in improvements on engines, we could, you know, they, there are consequences, probably more emissions. They'll, they will focus on what we tell them to. So I, 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 I don't know about the real the realism um, because there's so many unknowns about what we can do. What are what are your senses? Well, you know, I don't believe any state has adopted a mandate right, for a percentage. California for, for EV new vehicles. Yeah, it's, it's new. It's all new vehicles. So yeah. Nobody's going to say. The, 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 nobody's going to come and rip your and it's your, new, your ice car out of the driveway because it was the one that tipped it over the line or something. But it's all it's all new cars. Okay, I mean we've not gone nowhere near like the Nordic states, right? Nordic states have established a fixed date, right? And we've not done. So I, I, I'm of the view that we need to 
create the incentives and the associated investment in infrastructure and not a mandate of a certain outcome because because you know things that we don't know right so, I, so i'm not a, i'm not of the view that we could we could establish a target like nordic states have but, but i just don't think they don't know it they don't know enough right now so all i would say is that we all of these industries are somewhat regulated i'm, I'm okay putting a goal out there and then as we get closer to it, if it looks like it's not going to be possible or it's impractical, backing off the goals a little bit better than saying, well, I don't know how to figure it out. So I was never going to put a goal out there in the first place. I think in the interest of time, I think we'll stop the questions there. So um, sorry. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. I think uh, th this was a, a great discussion. Hopefully you learned something or, or made some or have some things to ponder. The thing that I really took away from this is that there are some clearly very smart people thinking about these things, which makes me feel better. So <laughs> if I took nothing away from this other than that, um, it is that. I'd also really like to thank our panelists. I really enjoyed the discussion. So thank you all for coming and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good job. Thanks. It was really nice to meet you live and in person. Yeah, you too. And since we're we're nearly neighbors, maybe we'll get a chance to uh, to see come to your.